So the, the reason why I find batteries exciting is, is first of all, because technologically they're very important and they're a forefront of the green energy transition. Um, but not only that, scientifically, they're really, really interesting. There's a swath of, of phenomena that take place along um, different time scales and length scales that are all encapsulated in this one small device. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm interested I'm interested in this region of the battery uh, research that has to do with molecular transport. So I aim to, to fit machine learning interatomic potentials to try to understand molecular mechanisms and how these molecular mechanisms underpin ion transport in electrolytes and also how they interact with interfaces and the kind of um, materials and the kind of um, um, matter they created interfaces. Uh, so some of the phenomena that are relevant here are solvation structure fluctuations around ions. This takes place at the 10 picosecond time scale. Solvent chemical exchange that basically underlines um, ionic transport, which takes place at the one order of magnitude higher. And then eventually we would like to get to the point where we can describe electrolyte reactivity and really the formation of this um, solid electrolyte interface that is paramount importance for, uh, for battery efficiency. So zooming in a little bit, this, this is your typical lithium ion battery. It has a graphite anode and a metal oxide cathode. And the separator between these two terminals is an electrolyte. And, and this electrolyte has really a double dual role. One is that of isolating electronically the two, the two electrodes, which ensures that all the electron transport happens outside the device through an external circuit and thus being useful to, to everyday electronics. And uh, the second role is that of mediating the ion transport. So all the charged species must be, must be able to, uh, to travel through this medium. So we set ourselves a, a easier task at first, that is of describing the pure solvent to start with. Um, and for lithium ion batteries, one of the most important solvent uses is this uh, LP57, which contains two different uh, organic carbonate molecules, EC and EMC in this specific ratio, 3366. And, and this makes for a very good solvent. Um, so the, the point of this solvent, in order to get good ion transport, it has to be able to dissociate the ions. So break the, ion, the strong ionic bonds between two ions, make sure these ions are freely floating. And they also have to be um, low viscosity enough, high mobility, so the ions can actually transport, can, can be transported across. And the high mobility is achieved usually with a linear carbonate, in this case, EMC that has a low dielectric constant, but high mobility. And the dissolution of the salt is achieved with, um, with a cyclic carbonate, in this case, EC, that has a high dipole moment and therefore a high uh, dielectric constant, which contributes to, to dividing the two ions apart. So we start with just the pure solvent and I'll show this is already a pretty, pretty difficult task. Um, and the reason we start with this, the, the pure solvent has just three atomic species, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, and the molecules are neutral, which means we don't have to deal with this long tail, one over R Coulomb, Coulomb forces, and the leading order forces, the one over R cubed, which, uh, which stems from the um, fixed charge uh, dipole electrostatics. Um, we made this task even a little bit more complicated um, because of where we are headed with this model. So normally in literature, when people tackle these molecular liquids, they, they do two things. They separate the intra and intermolecular contributions into two separate models because there's a large, there's the large scale difference between intra and inter forces and energies. And they use some baseline to, to tackle the long tails and the intermediate, uh, the intermediate attractions. But because our main goal is to go to a regime where we are trying to describe the uh, so-called say, the solid electrolyte interface where all these molecules undergo reactivity, they break down, they reform, many of these assumptions would fail. So we are, we are attempting here to fit the model without using any of these approximations. In the intermediate, um, intermediate uh, timescale, 
we, once we understand uh, the solvent and understand how to model it, we would like to add ions to it. And this will bring its own challenges. So the ions, the lithium PF6 in this case, bring in three extra species. So lithium, uh, phosphorus, and, and potassium. And this already increases quite a lot the, the difficulty to fit and, and the dimensionality of machine learning uh, uh, descriptors. So for this, we have different members in the group working on uh, methods development that, that deal with compression. Obviously, these new components will be charged. So we will now have to deal with the one over R uh, Coulomb, Coulomb force that decays much slower. So just a few words about the methods we use. This is um, the Gauss approximation potential gap has been developed by uh, Gabor Shani and, and his group. Here, there's a, there's a recent review in 2021 that goes beautifully through all the details of the method. So, so I'm not going to go in much detail here. The main idea is that we are trying to, to look in the neighborhood of, of, of target atoms and draw the mapping between the, the local geometry and local chemistry, the mapping to specific target ab initio properties, such as energy, forces, dipoles, and so on and so forth. So we start by, it, it, it's important to, to say that these are all local models. So obviously we have a cutoff and we can only describe um, uh, properties that are driven by, by locality. Um, so we start by expanding the atomic density into, into a radial basis, uh, as you see here, and a bunch of spherical harmonics. And then with those coefficients, the expansion coefficients, they are transformed in such a way that the atomic descriptors we obtain have a certain, a certain set of desirable uh, uh, symmetries. So they are translationally invariant, rotationally invariant, and they have permutational invariance as well. And this really, really simplifies a lot the, the, the complexity of the fit. So once we have these descriptors, <clears throat> we rely on a kernel method where, whereby we compare new uh, environments we'd like to predict properties for with a set of environments that we have in a database, a fixed set of environments that we have in a database called sparse points. And we compare this uh, through a similarity kernel. And all these properties are then, um, then predicted by the D coefficients that, that you can see in this sum. And finding these coefficients is, is pretty similar across all methods. We, we fit a loss function that minimizes the difference between the target properties and the predicted properties. And it has an additional regularization term, making sure that we are not overfitting our data. So equipped with all, this, um, the, with all these techniques, we go on to try to fit the potential for OPLS and sorry, for, for our target solvent composition. So we are in particular looking at uh, this 3366 composition or try to get a good potential uh, for a density around one gram per uh, centimeter cube at around 300 Kelvin. So the common wisdom says that we should try to get as diverse of a training set as we can. Uh, and in this view, we have used the cheap method, OPLS, to sample long enough molecular dynamics trajectories to make sure that all the configurations we find are decorrelated from each other. This ensures that every time we add a new configuration to the training set, it, it brings in the maximum amount of new information. We've also ensured that all these molecular dynamics remain diffusive to make sure that the, the liquid, the molecular, uh, the molecules in the liquid get the chance to diffuse around and find new local environments to maximize the amount of information we bring in. And we've done this over a wide range of densities, temperatures, and diffusive behaviors. All of these liquid configs are 12 molecules, and we selected liquid configs many tens of picoseconds apart, so they're known to be decorrelated. And we calculated ab initio values with PBE and a dispersion correction, G06. Okay, so obviously we go to much higher temperatures than what we want to, want to eventually want to describe, so up to 1200 Kelvin. And we expect that everything that we will predict is in an, extrapol in an interpolating regime. But lo and behold, uh, we get good RMSE uh, errors for energies, for forces, for virials, 
I try a swath of different models, 20, 20 or so gap models. Everything looks well in our, with our MSCs. You can do NVE dynamics or NVT dynamics, any kind of dynamics where the volume remains fixed. Everything looks well behaved. The potential energy surface is, is stable, fluctuates around the uh, stable equilibrium, equilibrium value. But when you use NPT dynamics, within 20 to 30 picoseconds, essentially all the different configurations you start from fall apart. So uh, molecules remain well behaved. The, the molecular geometries are all right. Um, but the liquid density collapses. Bubbles start to appear everywhere and the whole thing falls apart. So through a lot of work and, and careful analysis of all these trajectories, we have identified some of the key factors that contribute to this, to this issue. So one of them is obviously the OPLS configurations are not representative for the true potential energy surface. So this is one of the problem that we are all struggling with. It's this self-consistency problem of trying to learn a potential energy surface. You want to learn the potential energy surface, but you also want to learn it in a region which is actually relevant, thermodynamically relevant for the system that you're trying to study. And you don't know either of this. Obviously there's a connection between these two if you have the full potential energy surface, you will know the probability distribution as a Maxwell distribution on this, on this surface, but you don't know either of them. So you're trying to learn both of them at the same time. But there's an additional issue. It turns out that including only equilibrium configurations does not yield um, a robust potential. So in many, in many cases, we find that adding quite, hi quite highly non-equilibrium structures to the training set really helps to deal with some of these model pathologies. So in a way, it helps to define the boundary of the relevant space in configuration space. And at the heart of it all is, is this massive difference between the intra and inter interaction, right? So the loss functions that I showed you before is really dominated by the intra, intra degrees of freedom, which means that small errors on the intra degrees of freedom can be quite considerable errors on the inter, intermolecular degrees of freedom. So let me show you one by one how, how we tackle this problem. So first is the iterative training. What do we achieve through iterative training? We are exactly trying to solve that self-consistency problem. We start with a pretty coarse model. We start to run dynamics with it. We let it explore the potential energy surface. It, it will almost always find some, some regions of poor description. We're trying to identify those regions compute ab initio um, um, properties and fold them back into the training sets. And this is what we do. We start with a very coarse model from just 50 OPLS configs. And you know, generation zero, you can see within 20 picoseconds, most of the trajectories fail. We pick some of the configurations that have failed, we fold them back in and repeat. And we've done all these iterations with 12 molecules because you still need these um, configurations to be accessible to ab initial calculations. But most of the testing is done on 48 molecules because these small systems are quite often pl plagued by finite size effects. And we do this across multiple temperatures, 500 to 1200 Kelvin to make sure that when we predict we're in an uh, uh, interpolative regime, uh, we do this with multiple pressures and for now, the, fall, the proxy for folding things back in is just dense instabilities, essentially. This is semi-manual for now as we're learning about the systems. But in the future, we, we aim to have a much more automatic error measure and make sure that we have a clear protocol on how, how to grow these databases. Uh, so lo and behold, after 50 OPLS, uh, OPLS configs and 35 GAPMD configs, we obtain already something that looks like stable densities. So problem solved? Not really. When we look at now at 48 molecules NPT and much longer trajectories, we see that yes, densities are, cons are, are converged, but they, they are stable, but they are not really converged to the values we expect. And this sort of, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this in retrospect. Um, you, you see that Sometimes you would run a uh, simulation of the same thermodynamic, um, thermodynamic conditions of temperature and pressure, and, and they don't seem to converge to the same distribution. This indicates the potential energy surface is pretty unsmooth, and you know, you're, you're probably finding local molecular environments that are not well described. So it takes a long time to relax those modes to find, to find the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, so, so the idea here was, 
because this, this liquid is, is mixed, is a binary liquid, it deals with extra complication that molecules might see very different, very different molecular environments. In their, in their environment, they might see very different molecular compositions. So it's not sufficient to describe the target composition with just liquid configurations taken at the target compositions, because this will mean that different compositions will have very different level of description, level of accuracy in the training set. So to start, we wanted to test this idea by taking, taking a gap model that was fitted on, on just the target composition and trying to see if it's transferable. So we tried different compositions and immediately we see that all this composition fail in density. So this sort of, um, uh, this reinforces this idea. The next step was to take these compositions and fold them back into the training set. So continue the iterative training, but now with much more compositions. And as we expect, we get the densities of the different compositions to become stable. But most importantly, even at the reference composition, we get a much, much more well-behaved uh, dynamics. So this means that yes, it is important to, uh, to describe all the local environments with a similar level of accuracy, even though some of them might, might be much, uh, much less probable than others. This all looks good, but now we still observe some unphysical density ordering. So based on experiments and based on uh, other, other force fields like OPLS, we know that, that the least dense composition is 100% EMC and the most dense one is 100% EMC, EC and all the other compositions should fall in between. So we see a density ranking that does not obey that ordering. So in order to investigate this further, we developed a, a test I call the volume scan test, which is really a pure intermolecular, uh, intermolecular um, shows the pure intermolecular contributions to the potential energy surface. So we start with thermalized configurations from GAP MD here in the middle. And, and, um, and we both expand the box towards the free molecule regime, molecule in vacuum regime is in the limit, or, and also compress the box towards the highly repulsive regime when molecules really come together and Pauli repulsion starts to really play a role. And this is important because this is also important for intramolecular degrees of freedom because this training set so far has not seen any of the for instance, hydrogen, hydrogen dimer curves. And implicitly we put this information in by going to a really, really repulsive regime where all the atoms really come together a lot and we, we sample that region of the repulsion curve. Let me see you, let me show you exactly what, what I'm talking about. So it's actually helpful to look, to look at this uh, volume scans on a PCA plot. Um, where we just do a projection of the, of the descriptors. If the liquid, thermal liquid configs are in blue, the single molecules are in green, you see how the, the volume scans really draw the connection between the thermalized liquid configurations and the single molecule uh, regime. And in the other direction, they really extrapolate the, the, the curves into the repulsive regime. And this is what we see on the uh, energy volume binding curves. Um, so this, here, here I compare for two different compositions for some configurations taken from, from dynamics. I compare the DFT ground truth uh, energy curve versus the predicted GAP energy curve. And this is a, a GAP that has been, has been trained pretty well in through iterative training. And you can immediately see that it describes quite well the bottom of the well where most of the thermal configs live, uh, but it, it doesn't describe well the repulsive regime in here and the attractive regime in there. And this means that you obtain stable densities, but the values are too high because you're not describing too well the tails of the distribution. So how do we fix that? We can immediately add single, single molecules to the training set and we, we, get, we now get the correct curve in the limit of free molecule, but this, this unphysical barrier persists. And, and so does the poor description of the repulsive regime and the densities remain, remain high. And eventually we can fix this by uh, adding some of those volume scans back into the training set. So we started off uh, by considering these volume scans as a test, but it turns out that taking those configs and folding them back 
in is very, very beneficial for improving the model. Now we get both the repulsive regime quite well and we reproduce the entire EV curve. Uh, the shrewd ones might notice that this energy curve looks still quite non-smooth. So it turns out that yes, once you add the single molecules and the volume scans to the training, you do fix, um, you do fix this density ordering problem. Remember, if you look at the compositions, cross compositions, the, the order of the density has now been fixed. But we find this new type of pathologies where the densities quickly have an excur a quick excursion, um, you know, drop by 20% and they immediately recover. Um, and it turns out that, that these density excursions are actually related to uh, some of the non-smoothness of this, of this energy binding curves. Also, when you look at the molecular, the forces that molecules experience, uh, these are also quite non-smooth. This is the DFT uh, total force added over all atoms for one molecule uh, compared to the gap, gap force. So we bring in this cousin of gap, uh, turbo gap, that, that employs a turbo soap. It's, it's basically exactly the same settings. It just uses a different radial basis. And we see much smoother behavior for the EV curves. We see much smoother behavior for the forces. And we see that many of these issues are fixed in the dynamics. So there's no more density excursions and, and these densities now appear to be well converged. Bringing it all together, um, all that we have learned has been uh, now put into the models and we find that all the densities have converged um, across temperatures, across compositions. Um, we find that all densities are well reproducible at the same, at the same conditions and just warm off the press, uh, we, we got the result of our collaborators, the ab initio uh, result. They've been running this for three months. Um, uh, this is a NVT simulation because some of the issues that arise when you do NPT simulations with ab initio dynamics. And we look at pressure fluctuations and we try to extrapolate, um, the, this, this was done at three different volumes and we extrapolate the, the pressures to, to find the density at zero pressure. And this agrees very, very well with, with our gap, uh, with our gap, best gap model. So what we've learned, we've learned that MPT testing is crucial. Uh, NVE, NVT ensembles can sometimes really hide these problems, especially if, if the cells are small. If you have a large enough cell locally, uh, uh, those bits of liquids will, can still behave like NPT. So you might see some of these pathologies. Uh, they will be reflected in correlation functions. Um, iterative training is a must for obtaining a robust potential. Um, in mixed molecular liquids, there's the, this additional complication of molecular compositions. So you make, have to make sure that in order to describe the correct uh, distribution uh, for a large enough cell, you need to sample uh, at many different local compositions with smaller cells. And large volume fluctuations, including them in the training set, really helps to, to capture some of this subtle intermolecular interaction. So this is really nice because we can do this without baselining, without separating inter, inter uh, scales, which opens the, the door to go, to go to a reactivity uh, regime. And with that, I thank you for your attention. My advisor, Gabor Shani, our collaborators from Uppsala and, and, and uh, Shani Group for their lively discussion on an everyday basis.